Hello, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the sixth session of the TALP 2020 webinar series. Today, our speaker for the webinar is Mr. Alok Mathur. He has been a teacher and educator for more than three decades. He has worked for over 20 years at the Krishnamurti Foundation Schools in India as a teacher, house parent, curriculum developer, and administrator. Later, he moved into the field of teacher education, heading the Rishi Valley Institute for Teacher Education for over a decade. Apart from mentoring teachers and conducting teacher development programs in the KFI schools, he has contributed to teacher education curricula for the NCERT as well as NCTE Delhi. He co-taught the philosophy of education course in the blended learning MA elementary education program in Tata Institute of Social Sciences for several years as a visiting faculty. He is currently a visiting faculty at the Azim Premji University, Bangalore, engaging with students as well as teacher educators in their four-year BSc BA program. He is interested in participating in the creation of nurturing educational environments where young people can grow into self-aware, compassionate and creative individuals who may contribute to a sustainable and sane society. We are pleased to welcome you, sir. I now invite you to begin the session. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me uh, reasonably clearly and probably see me in one little corner of your window. This is uh, really a very new situation for all of us. Uh, first time I'm addressing a computer screen like this. And uh, so please bear with me now. Yeah? So I will be starting my presentation now. Uh, and I will be saying something about why I chose the four thinkers represented here, that is Dewey, Gandhi, Kairo, and Krishnamurti. Uh, first of all, this webinar, as you know, is related to the philosophy of education course of the Mumbai University MED program. And all these thinkers find a place in the course. So that's clearly one reason. But I have some other reasons too, to pick all these four thinkers, which I will mention as I go along. So what I would like to primarily do in this session is to share with you a broad framework through which one may engage with the ideas of thinkers on education in such a way that their words are not just words from the past, but have something to say to us directly as we grapple with the many challenging questions of education in contemporary contexts of India and the world today. So to begin with, I'd like to ask the question, who do we consider a thinker in education? And a broad answer to this question could be that it's any person who engages deliberately in understanding the connections between human nature, the nature of human knowledge, abilities, skills, and dispositions, as well as the social, social, cultural, political conditions of their times, and the challenges of living well and participating constructively in our complex human societies. And someone who's engaged deliberately will inevitably come across many educational implications of this kind of deliberation. And so one would expect that you could propose or experiment with reformulating the aims of education, rethinking even arrangements for educating the young, and uh, even perhaps reimagining the nature of pedagogy and the kind of culture of learning uh, that would be appropriate for this. Now, some individuals have done this very deeply and systematically in their own social and historical context. And the four thinkers that I would like to bring your focus on, to my mind, are what I would call transformative educators. Each of them has passionately worked for the betterment of, or transformation of individuals, communities, societies, and the world. So that is another reason for choosing them. Right. Let me now share what I consider as some of the enduring questions of education. Enduring meaning they are relevant for all times, for any time period, and which in some manner or the other, all thinkers in education are concerned with. These questions could of course be considered by anyone who's involved in education, in schools, in being teacher educators, in any kind of teaching learning uh, process. And I, by that I mean people like you and me. So we too are thinkers in education in our own way. And I hope during this session, we will, uh, in some way, through looking at what other thinkers have said, begin to clarify our own thoughts. So let me very briefly characterize these questions that I call the enduring questions in education. So these are the why questions, the for whom and by whom questions, 
the what questions and the how questions. And uh, of course, if you think a little bit about it, these questions are not uh, exclusive to each other. They are highly interconnected. One flows into the other and one feeds back into the other. So what are some of these questions? Uh, let's have a look at those. So on the why questions, there is a very basic question. Why is it necessary to formally educate the young in our human societies? And the normative question, why should education make a difference or bring a change in the individual, in society or the world? Then we could ask, what are we educating for? What are the purposes of education in a changing world? And the value-laden question, what knowledge, skills and values are considered the most important? Under education for whom and by whom, these questions, as you will see that they have a certain, certain socio-political background to them. So they are firstly questions of who is included, and who gets excluded by the provisions of schooling that a society creates, and what would be the impact of that. And then are there to be different kinds of education for different uh, sections of society? Should a democratic society strive to provide an education for all its citizens uh, in a comparable quality? And finally, questions like who actually teaches and to whom and with what attitudes? So these are the for whom and by whom questions. What questions uh, are clearly concerned with curriculum and its goals, the specific sociocultural content and knowledge, the skills and dispositions that are given importance at a particular point of time by the society while it's educating its young. And then there are the how questions, which are equally important. How do you put all of this into actual practice? So it's related to practices, pedagogy, relationships. And you could ask, how are schools and school systems to be organized? What kind of pedagogic practices are to be part of the school? And uh, what is the culture of learning? And very, very important, what kind of relationship should prevail or would be encouraged between students and teachers? So I, I just actually shared, and maybe you can see on the slides, the various questions that I consider as the enduring questions in education. And this is the lens through which we could look at the various thinkers in education and their ideas. So we will keep these questions in the back of our minds as we turn to the four thinkers and try to get at least a glimpse of what each has to offer. But again, it's the timeline of the four thinkers in education. Uh, you will notice that all these thinkers are from the late 19th and 20th century. Their lives overlapped. Dewey is the earliest among these and Friday the most recent among these thinkers. All of them lived through that part of the 20th century which saw two world wars as well as India's independence from colonial rule. Gandhi of course was assassinated soon after that. Now the text that I had sent ahead uh, from these four thinkers, I'm just uh, sharing a quick list of those books so, from John Dewey, there were extracts from Need for a Philosophy of Education and Democracy in Education. From Gandhi, it was mainly the story of Nain Talim that I extracted from. But I will be referring also to two other texts, Kim Swaraj, which is Gandhi's own original writing, and a very lovely article called My Magical School. From Power of Friday, it's his very well-known uh, work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And from Krishnamurti, I'm mostly taken from Life Ahead, but I will also be referring to a much earlier book, Education and the Significance of Life. So let's, let's get started then. Let me take the first thinker in my hand in mind, which is John Dewey. Now, John Dewey was an American philosopher and educator who lived at a time when the United States of America was undergoing major changes, was becoming an industrial, urbanized nation, and having earlier been more of a frontier agricultural society. And it was bringing uh, uh, economic and political power in the world. Now, Dewey had a deep concern for the maintenance of a cohesive democratic community amidst these complex economic, cultural, and global changes that were taking place. He was a deep thinker, a teacher, or a prolific writer. And the text I have chosen here is an edited version of an essay called The Need for a Philosophy of Education which is written in 1934. It's a relatively easy to read text, and yet it brings out some very important and interesting connections 
between education, school, and society. So I would love for you to read this essay, but here is a brief outline of what you will uh, come across in this. So the extract of the essay which I have shared begins with these lines, what is education? And Dewey goes on to explore this in a broad sense and makes a very plausible argument for what he is trying to say. I won't go over that right now. I would like you to read it yourself. But one thing very important that Dewey proposed is that to be educated really means that you have developed the innate human capacity of responding to changing conditions of society and of the times uh, that you can continue to learn and grow throughout life. And I think that all of us are facing that kind of a situation. We are all being put in very new situations and we have to adapt, learn, grow, uh, maybe draw new meaning out of the, the kind of situation that we have been put in. And he also said that someone who is educated would never become a fixed entity who is rigid in their outlooks and habits. Now, do we reimagine the aims of education that he felt were necessary for evolving a democratic culture in society, which to him was very central to the progress and well-being of people, not just in America, but elsewhere in the world too. And his essay discusses in some detail uh, a critique of the kind of education system that had uh, somehow got established post-industrial revolution. So he has discussed the failings of what he called traditional school education. And by this he meant the standard subject-based schooling, which has exams at the end of every period, which had become uh, common all over the world and which persists to build it till this day in most parts of the world, including very much here in India. For Dewey, uh, school was a microcosm of society, and students needed to be engaged in learning not only the required knowledge, but also the practical skills of life. In fact, he didn't distinguish between these. He felt that they were closely connected to each other. A lot of human knowledge had actually arisen out of the interaction with the environment right, and multiple uh, human purposes of every community. So he felt the school should try and recreate that kind of a situation too. But most important for him was that schools were inevitably involved in forming their pupils' fundamental dispositions, their intellectual and emotional responses towards nature and fellow human beings. Now, this was his way of indicating the moral nature of all school education. So that's a very uh, key aspect of view. Uh, of view. Now, he also said that when schools are not doing this job properly or failing in this moral dimension, they directly contribute to the violence and strife in a competitive, stratified world, stratified society. And as I had mentioned, he was deeply concerned with bringing a shift towards a more democratic, participative society. And he felt that public schools, public schools meaning schools run by a democratic government, which are accessible to all citizens, had to be a very central part of this process. So this is about the text that uh, I have sent ahead, and I'd like to share two very uh, interesting and telling quotes from this particular text in my next slide. So this is Dewey writing in 1934. So the first quote, it says, a society of free individuals in which all, to their own work, contribute to the liberation and enrichment of the lives of others is the only environment in which any individual can really grow normally to his full stature. Please take the importance of that in. And then he adds, in an environment in which some are practically enslaved, degraded, limited, will always react to create conditions that prevent the full development even of those who fancy to enjoy complete freedom for unhindered growth. So very often education is uh, characterized as something to develop the individual potential of each child. But Dewey is saying here that unless there's a certain social dimension to this growth, a certain uh, awareness and sensitivity to social conditions, to other people's lives, uh, taking that into account and being able to contribute constructively to that, you are not really creating a, a kind of a, a viable condition where each individual can actually discover their true uh, calling their true purpose or their individual contribution. So that's one quote. Yeah? The second one, the other need, this is towards the end of that essay, 
The other need, especially urgent at the present times, is connected with uh, the unprecedented wave of nationalistic sentiment, of racial and national, national prejudice, of readiness to resort to the ordeal of arms to settle questions that animates the world at the present time. The schools of the world must have somehow failed grievously for the rise of this evil spirit on so vast a scale would not have been possible. Now, this was written in 1934, and as we all know, this was a period between two world wars. But I'd like to raise the question, have these factors gone away? Are these factors in the world so very different from the world that we see today? So do think about it, eh? what we last, uh, this quote which he has put. Do we see the rise of this kind of feelings once again across the world? Eh? And in some way it has been brought into sharp relief by the current corona crisis. So a parallel question to this is, in what ways do you think a Dewey's idea is still relevant to today's world? So he was writing at the turn of the previous century. Now we are in the 21st century. So let me go on. I would like to add just one thing here. That Dewey's most well-known book is uh, one called Democracy and Education, which was written in 1916. And this is regarded as a seminal work on the importance of good public education for all citizens in a democratic society. It's a long book with a complex development of ideas, but I have personally found it very enlightening for an in-depth understanding that Dewey has for the connections between various dimensions of human life, society, history, politics, and philosophy at one level, and education, curriculum, subject matter, methods of teaching, and moral development at another level. So I have included a short excerpt in the reading that I have uh, put, put up to give you a brief taste of this, this particular book. So now let us turn to the next thinker, uh, and I'd like to take up Gandhi at this point. Now it's interesting that Gandhi was developing his socio-political vision along with his ideas on education around the same time as Dewey. His powerful book, Hind Swaraj, was in fact written in 1909, a few years before democracy and education. In this book, he rejects colonial and Western urban-centric models of education and begins to visualize an alternative way for education in India, which he saw uh, in the future. And it took two or three decades of experimenting and intensive discussions and debates with many other prominent Indians uh, by which time he could propose the ideas behind Nai Talim, which is also uh, another word for new education, and also came to be known as basic education. And over the next few decades, many such schools were established in different parts of the country. And the text I have uh, shared has excerpts from uh, a book called The Story of Nai Talim, written by Marjorie Sykes, who was an educator who closely collaborated with Gandhi and was instrumental in the development of the Nahi philosophy, as well as the pedagogic practices. He was a practical educator who worked, in fact, at Gandhi School in the Seva ground in Vardha. Now, so what, what is this uh, vision of Nahi What is the approach of Nahi uh, Let us take a brief look at that. You know? So these are excerpts from uh, Marjorie Sykes' book that I'm putting up. And I'll be... So Nahi visualized a new India where a community, a village community-based school would provide the foundation for a different kind of education. For Gandhi, education was not to be a bookish affair culminating in passing exams, a system which had been introduced quite thoroughly by the colonial administrators, but something much more practical and social in its orientation. So that is what his hope for this form of education was. And he felt that through this education, he would not only be able to develop the head, the intellect, but also the hands, that is, the bodily capacities, the physical capacities, and the hearts or souls, you know, the, the sensitivity, the ability to think about others, and so on, in young people. So Gandhi was clearly addressing uh, the why question as well as the for whom question in a very direct manner. He was trying to, in fact, uh, reinstate what he felt was the real India, which was the India in the villages, to a somewhat different level of outlook among the Indian population. Uh, 
where the urban people had begun to look down on labor, look down on village traditions. He wanted to elevate it to a much more uh, a different platform. Now, in terms of the what and how questions, he proposed that learning to work with your hands on some form of craft should be the center of the curriculum. And he also felt, and many others, in fact, worked on this aspect, that this working on the crafts could readily be accompanied by the study of all associated intellectual subjects too, in the form of what today we may call uh, project-based learning. Apart from this, students would also learn from their natural surroundings. He felt that the schools should be placed in open areas, not in uh, you know, closed buildings with high walls around them, and also participate in socially productive activities in the community. And so that would be another part of the curriculum of the school. Now it's worth reading further details of this full-blown experiment in education, which actually was tried out in various parts of the country. Uh, and one book that I would recommend, rather an article, is the one I've mentioned at the beginning, My Magical School, by a person called Abhay Bang, who went on to become a doctor. But he described the kind of experiences he had while growing up in a Ganjin school. In fact, it was a school in Sevagram. And the rich learning that he gained, uh, and the sorts of teachers that he had, I think it's something uh, worth looking at. Now, the author of this book, The Story of Naitalim, Marjorie Sykes, also tells us some reasons why Naitalim, or basic schools as they came to be called, did not get the kind of governmental support after Indian independence that they needed to flourish. They are now much fewer in number. In fact, uh, the school in Sevagram was closed down for a while, but fortunately, in 2005, it was revived once again, and with very good administration and leadership, it has now become a true Naitalim school in spirit and form. So probably it's a school worth visiting at some point. Or we could pause and ask here, so what was Gandhi's, uh, I mentioned that his ideas in education went hand in hand with his socio-political vision. So what was Gandhi's socio-political vision in proposing this kind of education and practicing this? I'm sure you would get a glimpse, you would be able to sort of visualize what he was really trying to do in this. Uh, so rather than Gandhi's words, now I'd like to share uh, words of uh, someone who was a great supporter of uh, basic education, an eminent educationist himself. This is Dr. Zakir Hussain, who was chancellor of uh, Jamia Millia University and later became the president of India. So Zakir Hussain has this to say, the work school is a society working for a common end. In its cooperative pattern of labor, the mistake of one may mar the work of the rest. The quick will not be able to leave the slow behind. It teaches its members on how to cooperate in spite of their differences of ability and temperament. So the driving force of such a school is cooperation and not competition. Not one trying to outdo the other, but together trying to put together something, learn something together, create a product together. So it teaches them to accept responsibility for their social duties. And the school, like the individual, must work for something more than itself, or it will merely substitute corporate greed, that is greed of a community, for individual greed. The small society of the school must serve the larger society around it. So in fact, we can think back to Dewey. Dewey also felt that schools were a microcosm of the kind of desirable society uh, there needs to be. And I think Zafir Hussain is probably reflecting something of that kind. He goes on to add, the non-violence should be the foundation of education, as of all other national activities, and should enable us to build a good state, which can realize justice and equal opportunity for all. Now, we can also say that through this educational scheme, Gandhi wanted to address the caste and class hierarchies of Indian society. It's a very deep total as much as the urban-rural divide. In fact, the two are connected to each other in some way. Now, as we all know, independent India pretty soon more or less veered away from this direction when it's pushed to industrialize, urbanize, and perhaps post-90s enter into global competition with other economies and societies. Gandhi did not succeed, and he remained a highly stratified, rapidly urbanizing, unequal society. This, however, does not take away the power of his vision. And I have myself wondered 
whether we might find ourselves returning to some of his ideas of community-based education in small ways and big, whether there will be different kinds of schools which will come into being uh, as time goes on. And in fact, this idea has actually never gone away, the idea of a self-reliant, self-sufficient, cooperative community. And could a school be a community like that? At the moment, what we are hearing is a lot of talk about uh, practices such as grow, make, and buy local. But perhaps this could also be extended to educate amidst the local, amidst your own environment, natural and social environment, even as one becomes aware of the global. So I think Gandhi's ideas still have a lot of power and potency, and many people do go back to them time and again. Okay, a brief pause point here. So we've looked at Huey and we've looked at Gandhi. Now, do you find that their ideas have any common ground? Gandhi was working in a society which had not yet become an independent democracy. It was uh, a traditional society colonized and searching for freedom. And Dewey was working in a well-established democracy, which was, however, undergoing many, many changes. So any thoughts you might have on this, please do and reflect and put them down. Uh, I move next to Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire was one of the most influential writers and teachers on the theory and practice of what has come to be called critical education. And Friday believed that human beings were incomplete and conditioned beings. They were caught in dehumanizing conditions. And that any true education must be for the fuller humanizing of human consciousness. These are the kinds of words and kinds of terms that he used. Now, Friday had grown up in a society with extreme inequalities too, just like India, which was Brazil. And he was acutely aware of this. And he participated both in his native country and in other parts of the world in the process of trying to catalyze a shift in the consciousness of those who were oppressed by the historical and social and political conditions in which they found themselves. He was primarily an adult educator. He worked with illiterate communities of workers, farmers, and so on, trying to bring literacy of a certain kind to them, uh, which is very different from just the alphabet and learning how to read. His notion of literacy itself was a very revolutionary one. He said, rather than read just a text, we are trying to learn how to read the world. He also asserted, and this is a very powerful insight of his, uh, which uh, I think we need to consider that all education, is, all education is highly political in nature. There's no education that is neutral. And in most cases, education and schooling is intended to maintain a certain status quo that suits dominant groups in society so that they can maintain their privileges and keep the oppressed sections of society in a state of bondage. And this they through, do through maintaining existing social structures as well as, as well as attitudes which have violence built into them. So with this kind of a perception, he worked at and he proposed, and he actually did it quite successfully in many places, he proposed a different kind of education which he thought was possible which required a deeper socio-political and humanist understanding, along with a dialogical mode of engagement between teachers and students. So something new he was talking about here. He called this problem-posing education, and this mode of engagement uh, came to be known by him as Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is also the title of his most well-known book. Now, Friday realized that no ruling regime, whether so-called democratic or of the right or of the left, would instinctively promote such an education. It was not in their interest. And it would, it would have to be individuals and communities that had been awakened to their own conditions through such a critical education who could create pockets of resistance and struggle that may build into a larger movement for social change and for a greater freedom and emancipation of the oppressed. Now, the extracts that I have taken are from chapter two of the book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It is a truly disturbing and eye-opening book that has inspired many critical educators around the world. Here, Friday brings out in great detail the ways in which he, what he calls a banking type of education becomes an instrument for sustaining the status quo, as well as the oppression of whole groups of people. Now, I'm not going to uh, sort of uh, dwell too long on this. Uh, his, his, uh, I think if you read the original text, it's a very 
interesting language that he uses. And the metaphor of a bank here really means that uh, ultimately it's the teachers who are depositing things which are inert in the minds of students. And the student's job is to passively accept, to memorize, to receive, and to repeat you know, when they're asked to. And this creates a certain power hierarchy between teachers and students, which is not uncommon in the school systems around the world. But he put it very, very strongly. And he said this really is actually due to a certain notion of human nature itself. That human beings are adaptable, manageable beings who can be made to fit into the structures that exist. And education is serving that purpose to perpetuate those structures. So without reading this critique that I have put down here, uh, I will just uh, share the gist of it. Now, I don't know whether uh, you know, this rings true from what you have seen of the education system that you have been part of or your own personal experience. But I think this is not too far off the mark, I think, for, for, for many people around the world. So this is the way education plays out. And Kaire was calling it out, saying it has its own political, uh, social, cultural purpose. And then what was the other approach that he proposed, which he called problem-posing education? Again, I won't read all the quotes out, but his aims in this were really, uh, I'll just pick out some of the uh, highlighted phases. First of all, he rejected banking concept in its entirety. He said we need to consider women and men as conscious beings, right? people who are capable of engaging with the world and making sense of it and creating new conditions for themselves. And this must be true of mode of inquiry, which is directed towards humanizing them. And in humanizing the oppressed, he said that the oppressor also needs to be humanized because in trying to hold people in a particular position, there's a certain dehumanization which has happened there itself. And so ultimately you need to do this in a in a situation of fellowship and solidarity. And read the last, uh, if you read the last uh, highlighted, no one can be authentically human while he prevents others from being so. I think this can echo back to one of the first statements that we read, which is from Dewey. So that was, uh, and he proposed this mode of dialogue, which I will come back to once again. Uh, he said that the teacher and the student are not two separate poles, but that uh, the teacher is also a learner, who also learns with the students. And the students can also not just be those who are taught, but also those who can teach. So this was something very revolutionary and new, I think, which was being brought into focus in the world of education. And it's had a wide impact in many parts of the world. Latin America, certainly, where uh, Friday did most of his work, and also in Africa, and uh, in Europe and North America, and to a smaller extent, I think, in India, too. Now, a very, a very quick question, and I won't dwell too long on this. Uh, Friday's ideas were, as I mentioned, mainly developed in the context of adult education. So in what ways could these apply to school education? Because many people have, in fact, drawn many lessons for school education, the way it needs to be conducted, the way it could be shifted. So uh, you could perhaps reflect on this yourself. Uh, I myself put down a few ideas, a few points here, which uh, I will again run through very quickly. I'm sorry about that. So there are clearly shifts in aims of school education, of becoming critically conscious of our own social conditioning, of the social political conditions and their impact. And this applies both to the teacher and to the school. Promote a certain capacity for reflection and action and an urge towards freedom in thinking and acting. And the curriculum needs to relate much more to students' lives, to society, to environment, than come packaged in ready-made textbooks with are standardized kinds of knowledge. Real life problems and issues need to be part of the curriculum. And the communication between teachers and students um, is best seen as a dialogic communication simply because, as you may have seen in the uh, opening slide, I, I worked in a center which was established by Krishnamurti. Uh, as a young man, I happened to meet him and was invited to join one of the schools he helped start, and I've been part of this educational community ever since. Now, I'd like to share with you a brief background about Krishnamurti. He was Indian by birth, but he went on to become a truly global presence. He traveled to many countries, spoke with a large number of people all through his long life, 
is a person with deep spiritual insight and a highly original thinker and educator. Being a keen observer of human nature and its follies, which he characterized as a collective madness, he tried to awaken his listeners to their own deep conditioning and to the inner sources of conflict and sorrow in human societies. Now, education of the young was very central to his concerns. Now, there's a large corpus of books and audiovisuals on education uh, that are available by Krishnamurti's ideas on education, but there are just a very few writings that were actually penned down by him. And the first book that he wrote was Education and the Significance of Life in 1953. But the extracts that I have shared to, uh, here are the introduction he wrote to a book called Life Ahead from the 1960s, which is a compilation of talks and conversations with students in his schools. Now, Krishnamurti was firstly, like Dewey, Gandhi, and Fayari, a strong critic of the different forms of modern scholastic education, which he said were designed to produce conformists who just fitted into what he termed as a rotten society. In his lifetime, he tried to plant the seeds of a very different kind of education. He helped start around seven schools in different parts of the world. Five of them are in India. And he wanted these to be schools without fear. He would visit them periodically and engage with students and teachers in a dialogue, challenging them to rethink many aspects of their life and living. And I'm able to just give you a glimpse of what he, what, what he had to say about some of the enduring questions of education that we had put up at the beginning. So these are some quotes from uh, Life Ahead, the introduction. What were the aims of a different kind of education for Krishnamurti? He says, it seems to me that a totally different kind of morality and conduct in an action that springs from an understanding of the whole process of living has become an urgent necessity in our world of mounting crises and problems. He was very acutely aware that the world was in fact moving in a direction which was becoming more and more complex, more and more problems, more and more issues that were coming up which people didn't really have uh, a response to. And he felt that a lot of these were because we didn't understand our own inner nature and the whole process of life itself and where we belonged in that whole process of life. And he felt that there could be a revolution which would take place, not an outside revolution, but an inner revolution. Now, if we are to emerge from the endless series of conflicts, frustrations, and anxieties that we are caught in. He felt such a revolution would begin not with theory and ideation, but with a radical transformation in the mind itself, a mind that had grown highly self-aware and sensitive. And such a transformation could be brought about only through right education and the total development of the human being. So he identified multiple aspects of the human being which needed to be brought forth, brought out, and to be integrated together into what he called the integrated individual, who was uh, constructive contributor to society rather than someone just fitting into a rotten society. Further goes on to say it's necessary to encourage the development of a good mind. I will not read the rest. It is essential for the mind to be aware of its own conditioning, its own motives and pursuits. So the very active socially conditioned nature within us which creates our own self and the self is almost driven in different directions uh, by uh, the kind of influences that have acted on you and which you adopt and make your own, identify yourself with. He says this itself separates human beings from one, other, one another and from nature and creates the multiple problems that we see in the world. This is in terms of the why of education. Now the how of education, what kind of schools and what kind of teachers. So this is from his earlier book, uh, Education and the Significance of Life. He writes here about right education. He says it's far more important to have schools with a limited number of boys and girls and the right kind of educators than to practice the latest and best methods in large institutions. So he didn't really uh, wish, uh, he said that unless there's a smaller community where there's face-to-face -face contact, where people can see each other as human beings and respond to each other, learn from each other, the school was not really doing what it was expected to do in today's conditions. He also says that the educator needs to be concerned with the freedom of the individual and not with his own preconceived idea which he's trying to push on to students, his own biases, and help the child to discover that freedom by encouraging him to understand his own environment, his own temperament, his background, and so on. 
Now again, I won't read all of these, but I'll just pause a little bit and let you uh, look at the slide. Uh, and you can see that he saw that this individual process of awakening would actually lead to a different kind of social order, a different kind of social relationships, where people are not competing with each other. Each one has found uh, a vocation that suits them. And it's not envy and comparison and one-upmanship which are driving individuals, communities, nations, which he saw was the process which was happening on a large scale. And social transformation, therefore, was in the hands of parents, teachers, and the children working together. So a few quick nuggets now from the kind of pedagogy, pedagogic ideas that he put forward, which I would call the seeds of a deeper learning. So you can again run through them. Talks about the child's natural curiosity, the urge to learn, which needs to be encouraged. You don't see children as someone whom you have to force to learn. They actually will bring that energy themselves if you approach them rightly. Teaching is the uh, is cultivation of an inquiring mind. The educator and the student are both learning. So again, this refers back to some of the thinkers we have talked about earlier. And doing things with your hands is equally important, and awakening your senses is very important too. And at the end, he says two very interesting things. Learning in the true sense of the word is possible only in that state of attention in which there is no outer or inner compulsion. Inner compulsions are many of the conditionings that have, which are driving us from within. And unless we can be aware of them and in some way set them aside, quench them, we really won't find a true response, a true action. The last statement, it is attention that allows silence to come upon the mind which is the opening of the door to creation. And this statement may seem a bit enigmatic. But as I had mentioned, Krishnamurti was someone with deep insight into human nature and about our relationship with nature and the creative impulse of the universe and life itself. And he felt that all individuals had the capacity to touch this deeper dimension of life from which all forms of life as well as human activity and thinking had emerged. And unless more and more people were unfolding such a capacity, the complex problems of society, of the world, would continue to plague humans, and along with them, all other forms of life too. In fact, he, he underlined this too. We seem to be at war with nature, and with climate change now upon us, we are pushing ourselves to the edge of a precipice with our habits of mind and inappropriate technologies. So is it not imperative that a different kind of education is experienced by more and more young people who are growing into the next generation? He said a new generation needs to come into being, which is thinking, living, feeling, responding differently. So with that, I will, in fact, uh, bring to a closure what I had to say about Krishnamurti. And I will just raise two questions to you at the end, which you could uh, respond again in your own time. One is, uh, if you look at Krishnamurti and Friere, they're coming from very different orientations. But do you see some ways in which their visions of education overlap, or some of their proposals overlap? And also, what are the ways in which they are distinctive from each other? And of course, one can see uh, resonances across Krishnamurti and Gandhi, Krishnamurti and Dewey too. And if we, at the end, uh, this is my last question to you, taking all these four thinkers whom I had deliberately chosen, in what ways do you see the ideas of these transformative thinkers as being relevant to today's times? What aspects of their thinking or what aspects of their whole approach do you think is something that we need to work with and deepen and bring to fruition in, in, in our current context, whether it's in India or whether it's the rest of the world? Hmm? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir. We have lots of interesting questions in the Q&A, so I'll just, you can respond to them. So the first question is, uh, the KFI schools are a success within the exclusive environment, which are mostly privileged. How do we enable this thinking among the larger society and make it more mainstream? I think that's a very, uh, very uh, uh, appropriate question to ask. Because I think it is true that Krishnamurti established his schools in large campuses, very close to nature, and uh, they are private schools, keeping, etc. Yeah? But I think if one looks through his corpus of his ideas, yeah, 
he may have worked with a particular section of society, but his ideas are actually applicable to all levels. And in some ways, uh, in, in some relative ways, I would say, they have been drawn out of the particular environments that he has created and moved into a larger mainstream structure also. In fact, many of the national documents now, including going back to right of education, often refer to Krishnamurti's ideas about uh, uh, you know, no punishment, no fear, uh, helping children through a supportive means. And this has actually been put into practice in many of the programs that the TFI schools have themselves developed and which are often mainstream now by many state governments. There is, of course, once they go into the hands of state governments, things do, uh, you know, many other political forces, social forces act too. But the ABL program in Tamil Nadu, the Nandi Kandi in Karnataka, etc., have been outflows in some way, uh, though highly diluted, highly reduced from, I think, the kinds of ideas that Krishnamurti have proposed. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question is, all philosophy of education and philosophers emphasize on humanizing individuals. But why does our education system dehumanize them? Yes. <laughs> so I think the baseline is that the education systems that have evolved historically, culturally, socially, politically have this tendency to dehumanize. So I would say there are these two currents always moving. One is the mass current and also as more the earlier education was the privilege of very few. As it's moved into mass education, uh, it has taken a certain character, it's taken a certain form, which is dehumanizing, standardizing, pushing people in a particular direction, depending on what political, social, cultural forces are at work at that time. Uh, who, who's making those kinds of decisions? Yeah? And it's not being really done in a very truly democratic spirit in the way Dewey would have visualized, where you're taking into account the needs of multiple sections of society. So it really is the, the, the role, I would say, of these philosophers and thinkers who penetrate much more deeply into the causes of what's happening, why it's happening, how it could be done differently, and to keep infusing that back into the stream in some way or the other. And it does make a difference. Dewey, there was a whole movement in USA, I think post-Dewey, which changed the character of schools quite a bit. Uh, there was a whole progressive movement where children were treated very differently, the curriculum was different. Uh, but, but it got washed over once again when other ideas and other regimes uh, came into being. Similarly, Gandhi had his impact for a period of time. And uh, Friday, as I've mentioned, has also been influential in emancipatory education of multiple communities. In fact, he himself, I think, gives the answer to your question that no government or regime will try to bring about an education which will bring significant social change. They tend to maintain status quo or make tinkering small changes. It's actually uh, individuals, communities, which can try to create a counter force and a different force for education, which is why I think the importance of these transformative educators is very, very critical. And Krishnamurti, yes, he's also started a set of schools and there are rural schools running on his lines. There are urban schools, there are schools which are uh, in, in different kinds of places which are also running along those lines or at least borrowing some of those ideas. So, and maybe it will have its own impact. Yeah. 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 So um, how do you think Dewey and Gandhi's ideas on education are relevant uh, in the current uh, ICT integrated education system? Uh, and how do we uh, balance between these virtual classes and also try to do hands-on activities? Uh, yes. In fact, that's really a big question that many, I would say, uh, schools, educators are asking. Is this going to be the shape of things that we will be talking like this? Now, I can't see any of you. Huh? and I have no idea about who's the other end, what your you know, uh, antecedents are, what concerns you're bringing. I can't see your faces. I can't see your expressions. And there's a real limitation to that. So there are, of course, things possible online. There are things, many things possible online. You can learn math very well. You can do, you know, various things. But that's really addressing a certain limited part of your nature and your urge to learn. Right? There are many other aspects to every human being. And uh, so if online education is seen as the panacea for the future, I think we are heading down a rather uh, depressing black hole, if I may use the word. 
Uh, so I think human contact is very, very important in education, uh, working with your local environment, working uh, with materials, um, working with the social context around you. Uh, so, uh, and if, if in some ways, in fact, in the lockdown period also, I know of, uh, I know of uh, some of uh, my educator friends were trying very different things through the online medium, not like me, just talking to you and taking a few questions. We actually created programs for children where they're helping them to see nature around them, even in their homes, just outside the window, looking at trees, birds, seeing the connections between things. So it's not necessary that you have to take a field trip, you know, only outside. You can actually from within your home itself, look out and be able to make. Uh, so the same educator has also created a program for understanding food issues, food security issues, because that's something so much on people's mind right now. How do food systems work? Uh, so starting with your own, what is on your own table, what is available now, what is not available, why is it, where did it come from, did we even think about it earlier, we took so many things for granted. So I think the online medium has its strengths, but it has its serious limitations also in terms of being a truly educative uh, medium. That is, my, that is my viewpoint on it. At the same time, we have to draw its affordances as best as we can. Right? I mean, all of you who may be MH students are not able to really attend classes right now. So this is like the best substitute, perhaps, you know, that you have an exposure of this kind. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much, sir. Yeah. Thank you. It was a very engaging session for all of us. And I'm sure we will have much more questions for you. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Huh? Anonymous audience, I can't see you, but I would still like to thank you all for being there uh, and giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Okay. Thanks.